Thanks for watching today. I pray that the message you're about to hear will empower you to use your voice, help change the way you think, and energize your faith. If you'd like to follow along with Pastor's Notes, you can find them on the on-demand page of walkingbyfaith.tv or on our app. Pastor Dwayne is bringing us a message today called Fear Not. We are living in a time like no one has ever seen before, and it is so easy for us to be fearful. But we must be strong, courageous, and put our trust in God. Pastor is going to teach us the best ways to do just that. On that note, let's dive right in. I was thinking how to begin. There was a scripture that came to my mind from the book of Psalms where David said, I was young and now I'm old. Well, I don't really consider myself old, but somebody might be looking thinking that's an old guy. All right. Uh, and David said, I was young and now I'm old. And there's certain things you only learn through age. He said, but I haven't seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. So no matter what you're going through today or what you may be concerned about, realize this, God has not forsaken you, right? And his seed, he said, he said your, your, your people, you are not going to be in shortage of bread. God is going to take care of you. Uh, Jeannie and I took our, our weekly Costco trip. And uh, we were like freaked out with all of the people and their concern and their grabbing. And, and as we were checking out, they were talking about uh, a person who had just become very belligerent about certain things that were going on in the store. But you need to realize God has not forsaken you and you will not have shortage because God is going to provide for you. In fact, today I want to talk to you and the title of this message is Fear Not. Fear not. And I want to take a scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, where Paul writes to his protege, Timothy, who has written him a letter and asked him questions because so many things are going wrong. Nero has become emperor. There's persecution going on. And he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. You know, fear in its epitome is actually driven and motivated by an evil spirit. And uh, yeah, yeah, what day was it? It was Friday. I got up in the morning. I was doing my devotions. Afterwards, I grabbed my phone, went to the news app. And literally almost every one of the headlines had to do with the coronavirus and uh, the, the things that were being said. And, and really what's happening is it's like a spirit of fear has grabbed a hold of so many people. In Isaiah 26 in verse three, it says, and you will keep him in perfect peace. Now I wanna ask you, are you right now in perfect peace? Or, or are you being motivated and driven by fear? God wants to keep you in perfect peace and it says, whose mind is stayed on you. Now, if we are looking at what the world is saying and the world is doing, we're gonna act like the world. And we're going to have the same reaction as the world. But he said, we need to have our mind stayed on him because we trust in him. So, so what are you meditating on and what are you thinking about? In Romans chapter one, it says, because although they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now notice it says to glorify God. And it really means to put value on God, to put value on what God says. Uh, the world is saying something, but I want you to know the kingdom of God is saying something else. God is saying something else. So what are we valuing? You know, when we glorify God, we put value on what God says about our situation over what the world says about our situation. And, and really, when we get in trouble, it's when we go our own way instead of God's way. Even if you go back to Genesis chapter three, Adam and Eve are in the garden. The serpent comes and says, hey, if you will eat of that tree, you will become like God. God said, don't eat of it, but you should eat of it. And when they went their way instead of God's ways and stepped the devil's thoughts and their thoughts instead of God's thoughts, it brought destruction into their life. And what we need to always do is we need to glorify God by valuing what God says, right? Taking what God says about our life, about who we are, about our situation, about our health, over what the world says. In Job chapter three, Job said this. He said, 
For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Now, notice the thing that he feared came upon him. We, we can really say it like this, that, that fear is faith in reverse. Just like faith brings God into our situation, fear opens a door for the devil to come into our situation. And what he feared came. Jesus said again and again, according to your faith, be it to you. Jesus was saying, what you believe is coming your way. Right? But what Job said is, I feared, and the thing that I feared, it came. Right? It's like fear opens the door for the enemy to come in. And we don't want to be in fear. We want to be in faith. In fact, in Mark 11, when Jesus talks about faith, he says, believe and do not doubt. Don't fear in your heart. Right? And so often we've got some faith and some fear, some doubt. And it's like our doubt and our fear is canceling out our faith. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, there's a lot of trouble in a lot of people's hearts today. There's turmoil. There's fear. Uh, there's dread of what's going to be happening in the future. But Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. He's saying, you don't need to let your emotions rule you. Because if you will feed on God's word and put God's word in your heart, he will keep you in perfect peace. That's what he said in Isaiah. So don't let your heart be troubled. He said, believe in God, believe also in me. Is your confidence in God or is it in our confidence in what the world is projecting is going to be happening to us and around about us? We need to keep ourselves trusting, focusing, glorifying God. You know, in, in uh, your Old Testament, the, the uh, book of Joshua talks about the children of Israel taking the promised land. And what's happened is Moses has just died. Now, Moses is the great deliverer. Moses is the lawgiver. He's the one who went up on Mount Sinai, met with God, and, and God wrote with his own hand the tablets that Moses brought down. He's the one who split the Red Sea. Uh, and he died. And now the people are looking to Joshua. And, and I cannot think of bigger shoes to fill than Moses' shoes. And now they're not just going, having passed through the desert. Now they've come to the promised land. But this is the land that they have got to go in and conquer. Moses really led through the desert in a time of peace. But now comes the time of conflict. And Joshua is the new leader. And I think it's interesting. This is what God says to Joshua. Verse 6. Be strong and of good courage. Verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. Verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. Be of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Verse 18. Only be strong and of good courage. Now, why is it that God keeps on telling Joshua, be strong, be of good courage, don't be afraid. Be strong, be very courageous, don't be afraid. Why does God keep on telling him that? Because he's being tempted to be afraid. Right? It's not that no temptations ever come, because they do come. Right? But when we keep on putting our trust and our confidence in God, in what God said, in fact, God, first thing God tells him, he says, wherever you put your foot, it's going to be yours. He said, and no one's going to be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And then he keeps telling them, be strong, be courageous, don't be afraid, only be very courageous, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, I'm with you, right? That's, that's really a picture for what you and I need to do. We need to realize that there's going to be discouragement, there's going to be fear that's going to try to come, there's going to be dread that's going to try to come, but we need to be strong, we need to be courageous, we need to believe what God says about us, about who we are, about what we have, about what belongs to us in Christ, about the authority that God has given us. In Joshua 1.8, he said, but this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night. I think it's interesting that right sandwiched in the middle between four of God's admonitions to be strong and courageous and not be afraid, we find that we're supposed to be meditating in God's word day and night. Because that's where the strength is going to come from. 
When we're looking to him, you know, when the angel appeared to Mary and gave her the proclamation that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, the angel said this, Luke 1, 37. It says, for with God, nothing is ever impossible. And no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. No word from God is without power. When God gives you a word, the power to bring that thing to pass is right there in that word that God has spoken. No word of God is void of power. We believe it. We confess it. We begin to move in that direction. And there is victory. In Psalms 103, in verse 2, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. Every disease, every virus, every attack of the enemy, he said he'll heal all. In fact, I'm going to ask everybody to just make a confession with me. The Lord is taking away from me all sickness. His word contains the ability to do what it says. His word will not return void, but will accomplish what it's sent to do. The Lord is taking away from me all sickness, every trace of weakness and deficiency. Sickness is going out of me now. Thank you, Father, for taking away from me all sickness like you said that you would. You see, don't be afraid. Now, now, now listen, somebody says, uh, what if something shows up? Well, first of all, let me say this. It was Stonewall Jackson who said, do not take counsel of your fears. Don't listen to fear. Well, a mentor of Jeannie and I, when we were missionaries, young missionaries, was Wayne Myers. And he had a saying, it went like this. He said, fear knocked at the door and faith answered and nobody was there. Right? Stay in faith. Remember God's promises to you to forgive all your iniquities, to heal all of your diseases. Now, here's what I know to be true. There is very seldom uncontested faith. Did you hear that? There is seldom uncontested faith. When Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River, the Bible says the Holy Spirit descends on him. And immediately, the Spirit leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And in, in Luke's gospel, it, it says it this way in the 13th verse of the fourth chapter. It says that finish the devil's harassments for the time being. That finished the devil's harassment for the time being. Three times, the Bible mentions specifically the temptations that Jesus went through. And that finished the devil's harassments for the time being. So he stood off at a distance, the devil, retreating until the time came to return and tempt Jesus again. Think about that. Jesus, God in the flesh, he's tempted. The devil backs up for a bit, but he's watching, right? He's not giving up. He's going to try again, right? In uncontested faith, but we seldom see uncontested faith. When you're believing God, the Bible says in Mark chapter four, the devil cries to come and steal the word, right? Now, how is he going to steal the word of peace from your life? Well, he's going to try to bring turmoil. How is he going to steal the word of joy from your life? He's going to try to bring something to destroy that joy. So, so realize that when you're believing God for something, it is not un, how can I say this? It is not abnormal for your faith to be tested, for the devil to come and say, hey, I'm going to try to steal that word. Jesus said that that word that was sown, the devil tries to come and steal that word. And the way that he does it, he tries to bring something into our life. But the Bible tells us, therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who may devour. Verse 9, resist him, steadfast in the faith. 
In other words, it's not abnormal for adversity to show up, for the devil to try to come and steal the word. But what we need to do is we need to stand strong in faith. We need to resist the enemy. In Numbers chapter 13, this is a, 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 a tremendous story. The children of Israel have been 40 years in the desert. Well, excuse me, they've come through the desert. The, the 40 years has not taken place yet. Moses has brought them through and they're right at the edge of the promised land. They're at a place called Kadesh Barnea. And God has said to them, I have given you the land. So Moses sends 12 spies in and says, go through the land. Tell us what it's like. Are, are there, is it fertile? Is it dry? Are there mountains? Are there rivers? Are, are there cities? What's it like? And they come back. And this is their report, 12 men. We went to the land where you sent us, and truly it flows with milk and honey. That's what God had said. His word was true. Now, God had also said, I've given you that land. You're going to go in, and I'm going to be with you. You're going to have victory. You're going to dispossess your enemies. They said, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities, they're fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains, the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy... It devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw entered a men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Now, two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, have said, let us go up at once. Let us take possession. We're well able. God's with us. But 10 said, we can't go up. Now, God had said they could, and they said they could not. And I love what God said about that. He said, they gave an evil report. When God says you're able and you say you're not, that's an evil report. When God says you are and you say I'm not, that's an evil report. The people respond, and this is what it says. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and they cried and the people wept that night. The children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness, the Lord has brought us to this land to fall by the sword that our wives and our children may become victims. It would be better for us to return to Egypt. So they're vocalizing their disbelief. They're saying, God has said, yes, we can go in, but we're telling you we cannot go in. Now, now I think it's interesting. Two spies said, let us go up. 10 said, impossible. The enemy is too great. It just reminds me of the news report on Friday. Almost everything was negative. Everything was building fear, right? So God says, how long will this people reject me? And how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them. Now, now, now God looks down and he says, hey, these people ought to be believing. Look at all the things that I've already done. There were the plagues in Egypt and I delivered them. They came to the Red Sea. I opened it up. They came through on dry ground and their enemies were drowned in the sea. As they're going through the desert, every day God brings down bread from heaven. They go and they speak to a rock and water's coming out of a rock. God is saying, look at all these wonderful things I've done. But they did not remember the testimonies of what God had done for them. And I want to remind you, in Hebrew, the word, word, root word for testimony literally means do again. Do again. God's saying, they should be looking at all the things I've already done. How I've already delivered. I've already healed. I've already guided. I've already blessed. I've already protected. I've already promoted. I've already given peace. I've already given joy. I've already put my favor on them. I've already set them apart. What's wrong with these people that they don't realize that what I've already done, I'm going to do again. He's going to do it again. We don't need to succumb to the fear of the world. Right? And then ultimately, literally what God said, he says, have you spoken in my ear? So I will do to you. 
Every one of you who's 20 years old and above that said you can't go in, you will not go in. Only two out of two million said, let us go up at once and take possession. That was Joshua and Caleb. And I think it is so interesting that they're the only two that went in. The ones that believed God received what God had for them. The ones that doubted God, they received what they believed was that they would not be able to go in. You know, I want to just encourage you to put your faith in your God. Isaiah 35 to strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees and say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong and fear not. Isaiah 41, for I, the Lord, your God will hold your right hand saying to you, fear not, I will help you. Second Timothy 1, 7, for God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. I'd like to really unpack that whole verse, but I just am going to take that spirit of fear and talk to you for a moment. Because I know a lot about fear because fear controlled my life for just over 20 years. I want to tell you a little story. It's a true story. I was in second grade. Uh, I was a terrible student. I was bored to death. I looked out the window, caught flies. You know, I just... And anyway, by the time second grade was done, I was really good at math, but I was terrible at reading, and I failed second grade. They kept me back because I couldn't read. Um, you know, I, I look back today almost 60 years later, and I think it was, it's not a big deal. But I want you to know when you're like seven years old, failing a grade in school is a big deal. I remember going back the next year. We're outside. We're playing on the merry-go-round. And the kids are going, Vanderclock is stupid, stupid. He can't read. He is stupid in second grade, stupid. You know, that's all my friends that are in the third grade. I mean, no, when you got friends like that, you don't even need a devil. <laughs> so we go through uh, second grade a, a second time. And uh, th this, this fear has just gripped me that I'm going to fail again because I still can't read which is funny for a guy today who just reads like crazy. But uh, I, at the time, it was just like I, I could not read. Well, fortunately, I did pass. But I remember I, I had a little bit. I had a jackknife about that big. And they passed out that report card and I had my knife open and I put it where I thought my heart was. And, and I said, if I fail, I will kill myself because I would rather be dead than be a stupid failure. Right? I passed. And, and somehow I kept on passing, you know. And uh, eventually, you know, graduate from high school and uh, I get saved and I, I end up in, in Bible college. And by this time, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I love the word and so I'm, I'm in the word all the time and I'm, I'm starting to do some studying and I'm doing well in Bible college and I, I meet Jeannie. After, uh, what would it have been after the first semester and in between our, our first and second year, we get married and we're back in, in Dallas at Bible school. And, and I had always thought, man, it'd be really cool to fly a plane. And the school was offering a course in aviation where you could get your, your, your license. And so I said to Jeannie, I said, this would really be cool. I, I think I'd like to do that. And, and she says, well, do it, do it, you know. So I did. I signed up and I started flying and I'm up there with the instructor and, and I don't know why, but this fear just hit me and I just kept on inside. I'm just hearing this, this, this thing going over and over again. You're going to die. You're going to die in a plane. You're going to die up here. You're going to die up here. You know, how stupid you don't die up there. You die when you hit the ground, but, <laughs> but serious, but you're going to die up here. You're going to die up here, you know? And uh, so I'm taking the lessons and the, the instructors there. Well, it came time for, for me to do my solo, all right? And, and I'm just like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. So, so I quit. I just quit. And I just said, Jeannie, I, said, I, go, I just get a headache. I don't really want to do that. And so I quit. Was that true? No, but I just told her that. I lied. I just didn't want to. I, I was just afraid, you know? So we end up, we, we graduate. Um, we're down in Mexico. We're missionaries. And um, 
I, I knew that I was really supposed to learn to fly, but I was just afraid. Well, Jeannie is from the state of Washington, and in her church there, just a few miles from her house, there was a man named Dorn who owned an airport and a flying service. And uh, we had preached at the church a few times, and we're in Mexico, and he writes me a letter. And, and he says, God has put on my heart that you are supposed to fly, learn to fly. And he says, and I want you to come and I will supply the airplane. I'll supply the instructor. All you have to do is show up. Now, I knew that was, that was God. I knew that. But I didn't want to. Right? And I was uh, 23 years old. I think I was 23. Yeah, I was 23 years old. So I said, yes, that's right. Um, we'll come up in two years. Now, listen, when you're 23, two years is forever. I thought, hey, this is never going to happen. So we, we've set a date a couple years later. But the problem is when you set a date, it comes. And sure enough, the date comes. And, and so uh, we shoot up there and start flying again with the instructor. Time comes. I'm supposed to solo. And I remember I am so, so afraid. I'm supposed to fly from this little airport to Moses Lake, a couple hundred miles each way. And Anyway, I get over to Moses Lake, and I do my, my landing, and I'm, I'm coming back. And it is one of those bumpy days, especially when you're in a little dinky Cessna 150, you know, 400 feet up, 150 feet down. You know, and I am just like, I am praying in tongues as loud as I can, all right? And I get lost. Don't ask me how. I did. I got lost, okay? So finally, I find the airport. I land. Right, uh, Dorn, the, the owner, he comes out and, and he says, hey, come on in my office. I want to talk to you a little bit. I got some stuff I want to ask you about the Bible. And so we're sitting there talking and they come in and, and I don't remember the exact amount. I think the plane held 22 gallons of fuel. And they said, we just put 24 gallons in. They said, we do, there's no reason that you did not crash. He says, you are literally running on fumes. And it was like, I heard a voice. I mean, inside it was like, you didn't die today, but tomorrow you'll die. So go back home and I'm Jeannie, you know, I'm telling her a little bit about the story. And next day I'm, I'm back out there. And this time I'm only doing what they call touch and goes. So you go around the airport and you land the plane, but you just hit the runway a little bit and you take right back off. You don't stop. So I'm doing those for like an hour, hour and a half. And I'm like, all right, good, we're done. You know? So I land that plane the last time. And there was a guy who had come and he had, he had taken and he had put his plane right next to the run. I mean, right next to the runway. All right? And so I land that plane and I'm hitting the brakes and they're on the two of them. Are, they're right there with your feet. I'm hitting the brakes and the, the, the plane, the brakes weren't working right. One side wasn't, wasn't working and the plane was just pulling way over right towards that, that parked plane. And when I got near that plane, bam, my wing hit that plane. And it was like you're in a car and you got rear-ended. And literally, my head goes, bam, and I hit the dash, and I kind of pass out. Well, when I did that, my hand hit the throttle and pushed it to the firewall. So in other words, I gave the plane all the gas it could take. And that plane went down the runway and took off, whoo, up in the air, stalled, wham, bam, hit the ground. I mean, stuck it in the ground like a dart. Okay. Now, if you ever crash a plane, I highly recommend you never do. But if you, if you ever crash a plane, I want to show you what happens. There is an emergency location device that goes off if you hit five G's, right? Well, that emergency location device goes off and it goes, Wah! I mean, it's just like there's more noise than you can imagine. I mean, people are, the farmers are stopping their tractors and jumping out and running over and cars on the road. I mean, this thing, people are running from the airport and they all run over and they pull me out and I got a bump on my head. I got a cut on my thumb. And other than that, I'm fine. All right. And this voice said to me, I miss today. You'll die next time. And I said, right then, I said, there'll never be a next time. So Dorn takes me in his office and Dorn says to me, oh, he says, don't let the crash in that plane bother you. He says, you know, he said, over here, you see that wire over there? He said, I hit that with my, my plane one time and I crashed and then I crashed over here another time and, and I crashed over here another time. And, and he says, and don't be afraid of flying. And I thought, you are an idiot. <laughs> I said, I, I, you, are an, you keep flying, you're nuts. I said, I'm done, you know? So I go home 
we were staying at Jeannie's folks, and, and uh, Jeannie met me at the door, and I said, honey, this is what happened. I crashed the plane, and, and uh, I said, I'm, I'm alive, and I said, I, I'm done. I quit. And Jeannie says, oh, no. She says, you need to go back tomorrow, and you need to get back in that plane, or you are going to be afraid. She said this, you are going to be afraid of flying. And I thought, going to be? Are you kidding? I will never get in a small plane again. Going to be. Right? So I lay down on the bed. I went and just laid down on the bed. And it was like the Spirit of God just filled the room. And I sensed God say to me, are you going to let fear run your life? And I, I hadn't thought of it in a decade. And in my mind, all of a sudden, I see myself back in second grade, the second time, getting a report card with that little knife over my heart and my saying, I would rather die than be a failure. And when I pictured that in my mind, it was like the Spirit of God said to me, fear, the fear of failure has dominated your life. And God began to show me things I was supposed to do in ministry that I was not doing because I was afraid. And it was like God said, are you going to let fear dominate you or are you going to fulfill your purpose? Are you going to do what I called you to do? And I said, well, God, I want to fulfill my purpose. I want to do what you've called me to do, but just don't ask me to fly. Yes, but no. And God said to me, he said, uh, this is your battleground. He said, you need to go back. I would like to tell you I went the next day. I did not. I think it was the third day. And you say, what did you do in the meantime? This was my scripture. God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. I quoted that thing so many times. And in the verse I tried to avoid was where Jesus said, lo, I am with you always. I said, no, I need you high. I need you high. <laughs> but literally, I remember going back three days later. Um, by the time I got out of the car, uh, I was just covered with sweat. I remember going out, getting in that plane, flying that day, and I think it was every day for the next 26 days, flying, getting the license, and then I kept flying until we moved back to uh, the United States, and I had to make a choice between our son going to school, Christian school, or flying, and at that point, uh, I put it aside. But it was something that I had to stand against. Hey, listen, faith is not that you never fear. It's not that you, there's, there's never an apprehension. But faith is you believe what God says more than the fear, than what the enemy says, than what the world says, than what people say. Right? God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. Right? And uh, right now I want to pray for you. And then I want us to uh, make a couple of confessions. And then uh, please don't, don't uh, turn out. I, I want to give an invitation. But Father, I pray right now for every person, wherever they're at with their device, that fear is trying to grip them. And Father, we glorify you. And we believe what you say about us, about our situation, about our health, about our finances about ourselves. We believe you. And I rebuke, I bind every spirit of fear that's trying to grab hold of the people of God. I bind you and I command you to loose them in Jesus' name. Now, Matthew 10 says this, that Jesus gave his disciples power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. How many of you know that that includes every kind of virus? He gave us authority. So I'd just like you to make a confession with me, all right? Starting with Psalms 103. Lord, I thank you. You forgive all my iniquities and you heal all my diseases. Jesus bore my sicknesses and carried my pains. Therefore, I give no place to sickness. God sent his word and healed me. No evil will befall me, nor shall any plague come by my dwelling. 
Jesus took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses. I refuse to allow sickness to dominate my body. The life of God flows in me. It brings healing to every fiber of my being. I'm redeemed from the curse of the law because Jesus redeemed me. That curse includes every sickness and every disease. I thank you, Lord. I am redeemed from every sickness and every disease in Jesus' name. Did you know the Bible says we've written these things to you that you may know that you have everlasting life? That's right. Know that you have it. Not, I hope I'm on my way to heaven. Not, I'm trying to be a good person. But you're supposed to know, not find out when you die, but know that you're right with God. And if you don't know that in your heart, I want to pray with you today. If you say, I want to be right with God. I want to be forgiven. I want to be a part of his family. I want to live for God. If that is you and you don't know for sure, you're just like, I thought I'd die and find out if I made it to heaven. Would you bow your head, pray this prayer with me? Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins. And I believe that he rose again. And I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm holding nothing back. I'm going to live for him every day. And I thank you that you love me, that you've heard my prayer, that you forgive me, that I'm a part of your family now today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that simple prayer, God heard that prayer, and you really are forgiven and right with God. Now, I wrote a book to help you keep growing spiritually, and I want to give it to you absolutely free of charge. Now, you can download that book, or you can contact us, and we will send you a hard copy free of charge. And again, this book is going to help you. It is going to bless you in your spiritual walk. God bless. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Duane, you're making one of the best decisions of your life, and that is so cool and so good. Just as Pastor said, we'd love to send you a free copy of his book, Your New Life. Log on to walkingbyfaith.tv and request a copy of this book to be mailed to you or download it right there instantly. Either way, it's absolutely free and a great resource for you to have. Today's program is available on Roku and Amazon Fire TV by searching Walking by Faith or you can check it out on our app where you can download any message for easy offline listening. Walking by Faith is used to change lives all around the world, on and off the air. We would love for you to partner with us and help make a difference in others' lives by logging on to walkingbyfaith.tv. If you're in need of prayer or God is doing amazing things in your life, we want to connect with you. Contact us by phone, email, or through our app. You can also find us on your favorite social platform by searching WBFTV. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of peace, love, and a sound mind. Keep this in mind as you go about your days. Have a blessed week.